shake before him the demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is
sing that again. The mountain shake before him. The mountain shake before him. The demons run and flee. At the very mention of the name of Jesus.
Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. So Lord, clap your hands, all you people. Shout the glories of our God. Aren't you glad he's made a way when there wasn't a way? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You may be seated. Thank God. Ben, you come, Megan, bring your family and girl, we're going to dedicate this precious baby girl here this morning to this wonderful family. Just stay right here. The, the, the other family members can come if they like, and, uh, and Grandma and Grandpa <laughs> can come if they like and stand with the family. And uh, she's a beautiful little girl. Can you get, can you get her on camera? She's like, I am large and in charge. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> She's so pretty. But uh, what a wonderful family. We love each one of them and, and uh, thank God for them. And, and uh, <laughs> hey, you okay? You want to come to me? <laughs> She's like, how in the world do we go from all that excitement we were having to settling down not doing nothing? You can sit right there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need to pray over 
<laughs> well, I tell you what, she's just doing what everybody else wants to right now. <laughs> no, uh, what, a, what a wonderful occasion this is. What a beautiful day where the family comes to celebrate this beautiful little girl that God's gifted you with. Yes. And what a gift from heaven. And uh, most of you don't know, but they just recently, in fact, just about a week ago, yes. I guess, uh, we're able to complete the adoption for this precious little girl. And uh, <laughs> see what I'm talking about? She is, she is personality plus. And uh, I, I, the only thing I know is we need to spend this time praying for you. <laughs> but she's the case. But uh, what a beautiful girl. It was Hannah that asked the Lord for a child, and God gave her a son. And all throughout the Bible, children were celebrated. Jesus even said, suffer the children to come to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, if you want to know what my kingdom's like, then look at this child right here. I wish we could have church like she's having right now. Wouldn't church be a lot more fun than what you guys make it? <laughs> He said, that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. So in a real sense, God has entrusted just a little touch of heaven in your home. And uh, I know it's your intent. If it's your intent to bring her today and give her back to God, I want you to just answer a couple, couple questions. Do you, do you recognize this is God's gift and you praise God for his gift that he's given? If so, answer, we do. We do. Do you promise to raise her in the fear and admonition of the Lord? If so, answer, we do. We do. Will, you, who, will you raise her in church and give her the benefit of church and of home and of school? If so, answer, we do. We do. And do you this day dedicate? Sorry. She's okay. I've been, I've been in the ministry for nearly 30 years. I've never had a dedication like this. <laughs> I'm just going to go with you. <laughs> I tell you what, if it's up to her, we'll have a revival meeting this morning. <laughs> She's, still She's still blessed. She, she's shouting like my mama used to. <laughs> I love it. The, <laughs> this is the way it ought to be. It ought to be a glorious celebration. <laughs> oh, help her, Jesus. <laughs> Holy Ghost really got her now. But do you this day dedicate this precious girl to God. In Jesus' name, if so, answer, we do. We're going to pray over you. You're going to have to let me do that. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <laughs> Father, I thank you and praise you for this girl. She is your girl. And I pray that your blessing would be upon her. I ask that you would watch over her her whole life. May she grow to serve you and love you and honor you all the days of her life. You said my sons and daughters would prophesy my goodness. And I pray that she will grow to tell this world by life and word the goodness of our God. And we bring her to you and dedicate her in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. In amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Let all God's people say amen. 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 That's good. Now you can run again. Everybody stand with me, please. You as a congregation promise to love this family, love this little girl, and also as a church stand with her and see that she grows to serve Jesus all the days of her life. If, if you will, say, by the grace of God, grace of God. We, will. we will. Amen. Let's celebrate God's goodness again, this beautiful girl. I love you, buddy. That's awesome. Thank you. Bless you, hon. What a beautiful kid. <laughs> Love you guys. God bless you, my friend. What's your name? Chris. Chris and Brittany. Brittany, nice to meet you. And Chuck. Chuck, nice to meet you. And Rhonda. And Rhonda, nice to meet you. Where are you folks from? We're from West Virginia, Charleston. Oh, okay. You know, Elder Todd, I was thinking the other day about Pastor Don, uh, the founding pastor of our church. Of course, your uncle, uh, Don Pfeiffer, was one of my hero preachers. 
and uh, over 27 years ago, coming off of a 40-day fast, and God sent him to Cincinnati, the whole area, to plant a church. I don't know what all he envisioned and all that he saw, but if he were standing here right now, seeing where God has placed us, I can see him right now shaking his head and getting blessed and raising his hands. One thing for certain, he, along with so many others, taught us that the gospel was all about God through his son Jesus changing people's lives. Amen. And that's why we're here. Amen. And the cool thing is God has brought us here to Milford to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with not only Milford, but the greater Cincinnati area and beyond. And Pastor, he is doing that. That's the yes. exciting part, to see the gospel going out and lives truly being changed. Yes, and it is exciting. Uh, I, I talked to someone the other day that uh, they came on Easter Sunday. They've been here ever since. They were one of the people that walked forward and accepted Christ after the service and talked with me and I prayed with them and they are so excited about what God is doing in their life and that testimony is repeated over and over and over and will be hundreds and thousands of times Amen. more Amen. and I'm excited and I know that you are Amen. as everybody is about all that God is doing here at Life Change Church. I don't know about you pastor but I think together we are lives changed. We are certainly Amen. lives that have been changed. Amen. I'm Ben. I'm Megan. And, and we, we are Lives changed. changed. Three years ago, I was unfaithful to Ben and I told him what had happened and he was quick to forgive me, which was a huge relief to me at the time. And we went on with normal everyday life and never dealt with the issue. And fast forward a year and a half later, Ben walked into the room and told me he wanted a divorce. So to kind of explain during that fast forward, I just kept on sweeping it under the rug. I forgave her, <clears throat> but it kept on haunting me. So I had this kind of man pride that I, I shouldn't get offended by these kind of things. Um, so as traveling uh, with my job, I ended up um, finding more comfort with other people around me. And on February 12th, I told her I didn't want this marriage to happen anymore, which led into um, me drinking a lot more, um, started to do drugs again, and um, sinky women. On When Ben told me he wanted a divorce on February 12th, I <clears throat> didn't want that. And so I knew that I had to hold on to hope, and I knew that God could change this and restore us. And I had this great community of people who came around me. Um, and God provided throughout that time. And it was a really hard summer, but on October 15th of last year, pastor called a, an evening service and we had just started hanging out again and coming back to church. And Ben went up to the altar and the Holy Spirit fell on both of us and true healing happened in our marriage. Healing that couldn't come from us just working on our own or doing other things, but true healing from God. And now our marriage has been better than ever and restored, and we are truly lives changed. Amen. We are truly lives changed. Thank you for sharing testimony. Think about that. A year and a half ago, what the devil meant to destroy a marriage, separate it, fall into the bad side of the 50% of marriages that end, God took and restored. Today we're dedicating a baby and sharing a testimony. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What the devil meant to destroy, God heals us from, then turns it back around and says, I'm going to do ministry for this, and I'm going to speak life into other people. Amen. Oh, what an amazing journey God is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, thank you for what you're doing in our lives. I've had the benefit of being in front of you for a few weeks. I have so much enjoyed the testimonies that I've heard. Every Sunday, people are grabbing me in the hall, in hallways saying, hey, you got to hear this testimony. Let me tell you what happened to me. This, right before this service, a gentleman come up and said, hey, I'm a business owner. Last year, I gave really big in an offering, and God restored back to me. I had customers call me and give me money back. I had suppliers call me and give more money back, and God opened up these doors. 
And the amount that I gave God returned back to me seven and a half times over. That's what God does. That's what God is able to do as long as we're willing to be obedient and follow after him. Psalms 96.3 says, Go declare my glory among the nations. Tell the wonders of my people of what's happening. We're declaring that in Milford. We are declaring God's glory in Batavia. And these testimonies are sharing the wonders of what's happening in our lives. Amen? God has so richly blessed us. Today is our big offering Sunday. Uh, as uh, the ushers are making their way, if you have not received a card, uh, a commitment card, if you would just raise your hand. They're going to come by and uh, give you one of these. Here's what we're asking you for this morning. As I'm getting ready to take the normal tithe and offering, at the end of this service, pastor is going to be taking the big offering. So normal offering now, big offering, I am a life change is going to happen after the service. Uh, and he'll be ministering and then, and then executing that. Here's what we're asking you for on the card. Please put your name on it. Number two, circle if you're willing to commit to praying for the finances of this church. If you're doing it online, you just check the box. If you're doing it an old-fashioned way on paper, just circle it. Number two, if you're committed to tithing and giving, circle that. I've had questions of, I'm already tithing, do I commit? Yeah, if you're already tithing, just circle that. If you're making a new commitment, circle that. We're going to take these cards, we're going to pray over them, we're going to be bringing opportunities to you for teaching and small groups around this, but we're committed to coming alongside of you and helping you. And then third, if you're giving a big offering today, just write an amount under number three. If you're going to stretch that across seven months, just let us know. Why is that? We want to take these. We want to pray over them. We want to ask God's blessing. We also want a record of where our giving is coming from and how we can celebrate that. Amen? That's what we're going to be doing is celebrating. So, normal offering now. After service, the big offering, I am a life changed. If you don't have a card, the ushers will get you one. And we're just asking you that you commit to pray, commit to tithing, and then also the amount that you're giving. Amen? One more thing about testimonies. Uh, we have committed as a church, we did not plan on this, but we've committed to it, is we want to capture as many of these testimonies as we can. Call the church office, uh, make an appointment with Todd or somebody on staff to come by and shoot. Many, many testimonies. Every say, my faith has been built just from hanging out in the hallways and people coming or a gentleman before service saying, hey, I want to share this with you. We want to capture those. Here's what happens when we capture testimonies. We look back and say, look at what God has done for us. We also take those testimonies that we're sharing like this morning and share it to other people to say, hey, you're not abnormal. You're not going through this weird thing. We're alongside of you, or you can do this, or God will bless. Amen? So if you're interested in sharing your, um, your testimony, just call the office and make an appointment. Okay, I promise I'm not going to preach this morning. I'll give you a scripture. 2 Corinthians. This is our offering service, offering scripture. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Right before this, Paul is talking to the church at Corinthian. He talks about sowing, uh, sowing seed. He said, if you sow a little, you get a little back. If you sow a lot, you get a lot back, kind of like a farmer. And like in Malachi, he just kind of flips that over a little bit and says, don't give because you have to. Oh, I got a tithe. I got an offering because God said I got, oh, I hate this. Don't give that way. And don't give to get. If I give a dollar, maybe I'll get $2 back. Not that way. He said, give with a cheerful heart, a happy heart. For me, if I personalize that, what that means is when I get to give, I get to celebrate with God, look at what you've done in my life. With cheer and happiness, I look back and I say, look at where God brought me from here. Look how he's given me a wonderful family. Look how he's given me talents. Look how he's given me blessings. I used to be able to spell poor with five or six O's. Every time that I give with a cheerful heart, I look at it and say, God, thank you for what you've done for me. And I am giving with a celebration and a heart that says, God, you are awesome and you are wonderful to me. That's what this scripture is saying. Not because I have to, but God, because I want to and I want to celebrate. Amen? 
I am a life that's changed. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for what you've done in my life, in the lives of all of these people. God, thank you for the testimonies that you've given. God, I know that you're going to do and bless and, and, and take this offering and multiply it. God, I thank you for what you're doing through this congregation as we entrench here in this community. And Lord, we lift you up. And God, I am a life that's changed because of what you've done. Amen. I can't take a heart that's broken Make it over again But I know a man who can I can't take a soul that sings it as the snow I know a man who can some call him savior the redeemer of all men but I know 
Aren't you glad you know that man this morning? Amen. I want you to turn in your Bible. While you're turning there, I'm going to talk about a couple of things, but turn with me to, to Acts chapter 2. And then I want you to flip all the way back, and we're going to deal with Leviticus chapter 23. So Acts chapter 2 and Leviticus 23. Now, I want to talk real quick about the 20th is Pentecost Sunday. We're starting a series this morning on Pentecost. And on the 20th, we're going to have a massive, in, in likeness of what it was like in Acts 2 when they came and had a party in, in Jerusalem, we're going to have one massive service that morning, and it's going to be outside. We're going to have an outdoor open air, under the canopy of the heavens, old-fashioned, red-hot, sin-killing, devil-driving, sky-blue, Holy Ghost meeting outside. Oh, we're going to have a time. We're going to march around the walls and count the towers, glory to God. But we're going to have an outdoor service. It's going to be an incredible celebration as we, on Pentecost Sunday, in some likeness of what it must have been like 2,000 years ago when they had gathered on the streets of Jerusalem. And since we have one service, I get to preach twice as long. That's going to be great. One person said, that's all right. And, uh, but it's going to be awesome. We're going to have, we've got our baptistry, and we're going to get some others. We're going to have an outdoor, because we have a portable baptistry, and uh, we're going to have a bunch of others. We're going to get some more and bring in. If I have to, we'll bring some pool in, pools in. I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to have an outdoor uh, uh, massive baptism. I want, to, I want to invite everybody on that day to be baptized. Now you say, well, I've already been baptized. That's all right. I want you to be baptized again. And we're going to have this big celebration as we, we kind of celebrate what it must have been like on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 people got saved and they were all baptized. It's going to be a blast. One service outside. Now, here's the thing. Uh, if you want to sit down during the service, bring a chair. I'm not going to rent chairs. Bring a lawn chair. Bring something. Bring a recliner. I don't care. Bring a chair if you want to sit down. I thought about uh, doing it the Bible way because in the Bible, the people stood and the teacher sat. I thought about me sitting, you stand, but we know that wouldn't work very long with me. I, I'd be out of that chair real quick. That's just not my style. But it's going to be a great day of celebration. One service, and uh, May the 20th, open air, under the canopy of the heavens, going to be a great day. Pray that it doesn't rain, and, and, and for some crazy reason, which it could happen in Cincinnati, that winter doesn't come back one more day. I don't know. It could happen. I pray that it doesn't happen. I told them in the early service, my mother uh, was saved, and uh, this was in the winter, and over there in the hills, Raccoon Creek, was, it's the, one of the largest creeks in the world. It's just under the size of a river. But they went out in January and broke the ice, and my mama was baptized in that ice-cold water. That's how the old-timers, when they got saved back in the day, children, we didn't have indoor baptistries, and if it was warm, if it was hot, if it was cold, if it was sub-weather, it didn't matter. They broke the ice, and you got baptized. So I'm going to tell you, no matter what the weather is, we're going to do some baptizing outside, and we'll just weed them out, and we'll see who's got the goods and who don't. It's going to be a great day, and you come with, with great anticipation. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Would you stand, please, and let us reverence the Word of God. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We're preaching about Pentecost for the next few weeks, starting today. Let us pray. Father, I pray that not only 
will you add your blessing to the reading of your word. But we ask, Lord, that you would add your blessing, your unction, your anointing to the preaching of your word. Cause divine truth to be understood and received and effective in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There are three things in the Old Testament that supersede the law. There's always this debate in the modern day church, this war, you could say, that takes place back and forth between grace and law. And people say, you know, well, we're not living under the law. And I want to say at the offset, I am thankful to heaven. <clears throat> I am thankful to heaven that we are not living under the law. I appreciate and thank God for his grace, don't you? We're not living under the law. But there are things in the Bible that supersede the law. In other words, they're not legal issues. They're redemptive in nature. In other words, they are based out of the redemptive plan of God of which the law played a part. But these things supersede the Ten Commandments and they supersede the law of Moses. Let me give you three things in the Old Testament. One, the shedding of blood. That came before the law of sacrifice. God performed the first sacrifice in Genesis chapter 3 as he killed the animal, spilled the blood, and put the coats of fur around Adam and Eve, thus covering them in their shame, in their sin, and in their nakedness. And we can testify this morning that all of our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not a legal issue. It was a redemptive issue that took place in the council of heaven before the foundations of the earth the bible says christ was slain i'll give you something else that's not a legal issue tithing is not a law issue for tithing took place the tenth of our income that took place hundreds of years before the law was given when abraham tied to Melchizedek, who was a high priest, a type of Christ in the Old Testament, and really some scholars believe he was a manifestation of the second person of the Trinity in the Old Testament, Jesus, and Abraham tied to Melchizedek hundreds of years before the law was given. I know people say, well, I don't believe in tithing because that's, that's the law. That's not law. That's principle. There's a big difference in law and principle. Is it in the law? It is in the law. So is the redemptive plan of God in the law. But these things supersede. And even if it were a legal issue, let's just say this real quick before I get into the sermon. Even if it were, every time, say every time, every time Jesus mentioned anything legally, he always upped the ante. For example... He said, if you commit the act of adultery, you're guilty, he said, in the law. But I say, if you look at someone in lust, you're already guilty of the sin of adultery. Jesus said, the law says, if you commit murder, then you're guilty. But he said, I say, if you have hatred in your heart towards somebody, you're already guilty of the act of of murder. Every time he mentioned the law in some way, he always upped the ante. Now, aren't you glad Jesus didn't talk a lot about tithing? Because he would have upped the ante. In the book of Acts, sometimes they gave everything they had. Going over like a lead balloon. That's okay, because that's where we live, isn't it? Now, let me give you another thing that's not a law issue. The feast took place and the festivals took place before the law. Uh, the feast of Passover. The feast of first fruits. And this one, 
You know, every time we think about Pentecost, the first thing that comes to people's mind that go to church every Sunday is Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. But don't you find it interesting that in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, very little is said of Pentecost. As a matter of fact, they had convened to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And when the question was asked, when, when the Holy Spirit came, when the question was asked, Peter didn't say, oh, this is about Pentecost. He said, this that has happened is what Joel promised, that in the last days, God would pour out his Spirit upon all flesh. In other words, he was saying God chose during the Feast of Pentecost to pour out his spirit and give birth to the church now if that's true though should we not take a look at what Pentecost was and is I think we should so let's go back Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 15 he said and you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, ye shall number fifty days. Pentecost means fifty. And ye shall offer a new burnt offering unto the Lord. You shall bring, there it is on the screen, you shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals they shall be a fine flour they shall be bacon with leaven they are the first fruits unto the Lord so there is a short explanation of what Pentecost was all about it was a celebration let me say that again Pentecost was a celebration that's why when you come to church Church ought to be a celebration. Not a... No. Church should be a celebration. I had someone say to me one time, my church is dead. I said, well, you go to it. They, saying, should I, they said, should I leave? I said, I'm not saying you should leave. I'm saying you ought to bring some life. If you're saying your church is dead and you're there, you're confessing your own sin. I got news for you. I don't need you to have a celebration. I can have a party without you. No, Pentecost was a celebration of what? It was a celebration of how God had delivered them out of Egyptian bondage. 400 years, they cried for a deliverer. 400 years, a redeemer. 400 years, making bricks in the hot sun for Pharaoh. Under the lash and the whip of a tyrant, a tyrant under tyranny. Here they are, 400 years, begging God to send someone to deliver them. And God raised up Moses right within their household. And 40 years on the back desert prepared him. And then there's the burning bush. And God said, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses goes down and says to Pharaoh God has said let my people go and after 10 plagues and the 10th one that's the big deal it is a portrait a picture of Christ the Passover for God had said tell my people to, to slaughter a lamb spill the blood in a bowl take hyssop and paint the lintel and the post of the door and this evening when the death angel comes through when he sees the blood, he will pass over. I want to tell you something. I'm so thankful one day I had the blood of Jesus Christ painted to my heart. There's been a lot of things had to pass by me because of the blood. And when you have the blood applied to your life, there's a lot of things that have to pass by you because of the blood. Somebody say amen. amen. And that night when the death angel came through, Everyone that had the, the blood applied to the door, the angel of the Lord, the, the death angel went by and he would pass by those that had the blood. And any home that did not have the blood, the firstborn of that home would die. Breath snuffed from his lungs and lay dead. 
And Pharaoh said, get out of here. And all of God's people showered with the wealth of Egypt. They poured wealth upon them. And there's, there's a lot of preaching here. And they left Egypt. And there they are, the Red Sea. And Pharaoh changed his mind and came after them. And God put a wall of fire to hold off Pharaoh. And he opened up the Red Sea. And God delivered them supernaturally out of Egyptian bondage. And then that verse comes into play. They celebrated with the sheaves of wave offerings. They Listen, if you were under some kind of tyranny and you were living in enslavement and God mightily delivered you out, don't you think you would have a party too? Hmm? By the way, you were. We were all in sin. And God delivered us out. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to get to the point because I want to draw the parallel. Fifty days. Fifty days out of Egypt. Everyone say 50. 50. Fifty days out of Egypt. Pentecost celebration. And Moses goes up on Sinai. And there God descends. And with his own finger starts to chisel out in stone. Thou shalt. And thou shalt not. And he gives the law. Fifty days out of Egypt, the law is given. And you know what they're doing in the valley? Pentecost is taking place. It's Pentecost. Uh, because Pentecost was about celebration and offering. There was a first fruit and then a Pentecost first fruit offering. And in the valley, they took the gifts and the blessings that God had given them, and they chose to have Pentecost in this fashion. It's in your Bible. It's the Old Testament in your Bible. Fifty days out of Egypt, law is given, and they take the wealth and the gold and the silver that they've been showered with and they take some of it and they throw it all together in a pot and build a fire and start molding a golden calf. They took their Pentecost offering and built something of their own hands to worship. Idolatry. They took what God had blessed them with and worshipped the car or a flat screen or jewelry. It's getting real quiet now. They, they worship. The issue wasn't the wealth. The issue is what they were willing to do in recognition with the blessing that God had given them. And the offering they decided to make was to build a, an idol for them to worship of their own accord. And Moses comes down off the mountain, the glow of God on his face, and the Ten Commandments, those tablets in his hands. And there are the people dancing around this golden calf and having a party. And Moses got angry and he threw the tablets at the calf and broke the law just like all of us have done. We've all broken the law of God. And he throws those tablets and he draws a line in the sand and he said, who's on the Lord's side? Come over here. And they pull the sword and the Bible says, 3,000 people died that day. Amen. 3,000. Now let's go forward. It's Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit falls on the 120 that are gathered in the upper room. They housing the glory of God in their chest. They, with the glow of heaven upon their face, 
they as firebrands plucked out from the order of God himself were thrown out of that upper room into the streets of Jerusalem and they with fire in their eyes and gravel in their belly Peter stands up and he preaches the gospel and 3,000 people got saved 50 days after the resurrection the Holy Ghost falls the spirit of grace and life comes and 3,000 saved do you see the parallel 50 days out of Egypt the law is given they build a calf of their offering it's idolatry they deny God and 3,000 people die on the day of Pentecost 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord, the Holy Spirit falls, the gospel is preached, and 3,000 live. What kind of Pentecost do you want? What kind of Pentecost do we want to experience? I don't know about you. I want life. I want the Holy Spirit. I want lives changed. Now, Pentecost, go back to the verse. If you're Pentecost, go back to the Old Testament passage, please. Now, Pentecost was this gathering where go to the next verse please where they would celebrate and they would bring a first fruits unto the Lord now this was after a first fruits offering they would convene after they gave a first fruits offering they would convene on the day of Pentecost. This is what's happening in Acts chapter 2. They are all gathering and they're bringing an offering. Are you still with me? Now I want to show you something. I had someone ask me not long ago, they said, why do you put such a premium? Why do you think it's so important that we, that we do this? We're not under the law, we're under grace. Why do you think it's so important that we do this? I'm going to give you the simple answer. Because this is what God did. Let me say that again. You're not going to let me preach. The early service let me preach. You guys are bored with it. But I'm going to give you the truth. And then you can deal with the truth however you want to deal with it. You can, you can build a golden calf or you can have spirit and life. It's up to you. You say, am I buying? You're not buying anything. I'm showing you that this thing all takes place, and the reason why giving is so important is because this is what God did. Now, let me teach you something. God gave a first fruits offering because he wanted sons. Everyone say sons. So the Bible says, God so loved the world, he what? Gave. His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Paul said that Jesus Christ is the first fruit. This is in your Bible in the New Testament. Jesus Christ is the first fruit of many. In other words, we are all here and we're His sons and there will be millions gather in heaven someday because God planted in the earth the first fruits of all that would come. It's a harvest thing. Jesus, first fruits of many. And now you're saved because God gave. Now, how can we even begin to say, God's a giver, but he don't expect me to be one. 
God's a giver, but he lets me wiggle off the hook. I don't need to be that. That's like you saying to your son, this is who we are and this is how we live and we're good to people, but you go ahead and do whatever you want. No, your son, you want him to act the same way. You say, listen, that's not the kind of people we are. And God says, listen, that's not the kind of man that I am. God said, I want sons, and I will give the first fruit. I will plant it in the earth. I will give my son. And if I give my son, then that can multiply into millions of sons. And God did the same thing when he gave birth to the church. He did the same thing. On the day of Pentecost, God gave a first fruit offering on the cross. And he gave an offering at Pentecost with his 120. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There were 120. And God says, I'm going to take my 120 that have come to faith before the cross even existed, before Jesus died. They came to faith. And he said, now I'm going to take that 120 and I'm going to give them. It was a Pentecost offering. You understand? You understand that most of the 120 that received the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, most of them, most of them were martyrs. Look at me. Most of them were martyrs. They did not live long after that. All the disciples except for one was martyred for their faith. And John was exiled to an island. Listen to me. It bothers me to no end that we get all squeamish about giving in an offering. And here God says, I'm going to take my 120 and I'm going to... Yes, amen. Huh? I think I read recently that uh, over 90% of people that go to church every Sunday don't even tithe, let alone give a first fruit or a Pentecost offering or anything else above the tithe. They don't even tithe. Over 90% of people that go to church every Sunday give very little, if anything, to the propagation of the gospel. Are you in this building? Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, how, how is it we can reconcile this? That God says... I'm going to give everything that I have and all that I have gained, I'm going to give it all and they are going to give all they are and all they have for the purpose of souls. He invested 120 back out into the streets and 3,000 people got saved. And of the early church, they began to pour all that they were and all that they had for the preaching of the gospel. Yes. Amen. Let me give you another Bible verse. In the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, people were so ramped up about the gospel being preached and about the establishing of the church that they were selling stuff and bringing all the proceeds. And Ananias and Sapphira, for example, Barnabas had sold a lot of property and brought all the money and gave it. And Ananias and Sapphira wanted to have the same acclaim that Barnabas had. And so they sold a massive piece of property that they owned. And they brought the money in. And they said to Peter, this is all the money from, our, from ourselves." And Peter said, you're lying to the Holy Ghost. Because they only brought part of it. And you know what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? They fell over dead right there in the church. Well, if I could reenact that, I'd get an offering today, wouldn't I? Look at me. Everybody look at me. Ananias and Sapphira fell over dead for lying to the Holy Ghost over the issue of giving. And that did not happen under the law. That happened under grace. Put that in your legal pipe and smoke it. Did you hear what I just said? In other words, God, God puts a high premium on this stuff. See, the issue in our personal life is this. The issue is this. Are we going to, as they did around Sinai, build a golden calf of what God has given us? They took their earrings and necklaces and all the other stuff that they got from Egypt. 
There's nothing wrong with having stuff. There's nothing wrong with wearing earrings and necklaces and all that. You, you wear all you want to wear, you know. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I grew up in a church where it was wrong. Well, you put a necklace on or rings and it, oh, little dangly things. Take your dangling things off your ears. Blessed be God. Worldly. They didn't say worldly. There was no D in it. Worldly. It's worldly. Is there anybody else from the hills know what I'm talking about? Come on. They preach against that stuff down there in West Virginia and Kentucky and Southern Ohio. Worldly. I used to always say it all the preachers that preached that. Listen, the children of Israel did not get in trouble with their jewelry until they took it off and made a golden cap out of it. But they, they took the stuff that they had been blessed with by God out, coming out of Egypt. They took all that they had been blessed with by God coming out of Egypt. And they said, instead of offering it to God, we're going to offer it to ourselves." I'm preaching something right now. We take, we take the offerings, the money that God tells us to give, and we make a calf. It could be a car, it could be anything. And we put it in stuff that, listen, there's nothing wrong with having stuff. There's the problem when the stuff has you. The way the blessing of God works, when you give, things multiply. I want, let, me, let me just say this while I'm here in regards to giving. When you give, you should expect it to multiply. I know our good brother said a little bit ago, and I know what he means by what he said. He said, don't give, with, don't give to get. I know what he means. But you should give with the expectation of receiving. Do you hear what I'm saying? Don't give with the motive of getting, but give with the faith of expectation of giving, getting back. Because God said, given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men pour in your bosom. I mean, if I give and don't expect to receive blessing from it, then, then I'm really disobeying what the Lord said. I expect God to bless me. I know he's going to bless me when I give. I know he's going to bring supernatural blessing into my life when I give. I know he's going to open up opportunities when I give. And let me tell you this. Whenever God blesses you with stuff, and he, t he says, give the 10%, and that's the first thing. He says to give an offering, and that's beyond that. When God does that, when he tells you to give something, and the moment he says give it, whether it's a dollar or a hundred dollars or 10,000, I don't care what it is, the moment God says to give it, it, it is his at that moment. And once it becomes his, if you think you can hold on to it and it don't go bad, that's like the manna that came out of heaven. They try to store that up in the tent and it went bad every time. Don't ever think you'll hold on to what already belongs to God. It'll never happen. You'll lose it one way or another. It will go bye-bye. It's not going to stay in your account. It will leave. And it always costs you more when you try to hold on to what belongs to God. I was talking to a guy one day. I'm going to let you go here in just a minute. I was talking to a guy one day, and he said, I went to this church, and they, you know, they talked about giving and tithing and different things like that. And he said, I got mad. He said, I, I'd gotten saved. And he, he started talking about that, and he said, I told that preacher off. And he said, I said, I ain't going back. All they're after is your money. That church and that preacher, he just wants nothing but my money. Just after my money. All the church wants is my money. You ever hear people say that? All they want is my money. What do you think the bar wants? I mean, God says give 10% and then give whatever else I ask you to give. The bar says, I want you to, I want you to drink up your kids' clothing and your kids' food and your school fees. And Satan won't stop until it's all gone. I'm preaching good right now. What do you think this world's going to take from you? They're going to take everything and leave you destitute and have nothing left. Huh? And if it, don't, if it don't take all your money, then your money will be corrupt in your belly and you'll never enjoy a cent of it. You cannot enjoy what's cursed. You cannot. It'll multiply curse in your life. I want to tell you something. I'd rather have $10 blessed of God than $10 million cursed by God. 
I can pillow my head at night and I can know I gave what God told me to give. I've given my tithe. I've given the offerings that he told me to give. And I know that I'm in a right stead and I've mirrored his glory in my life and I've done what he has done and I've mirrored in some small similitude what God has done and I'm obedient in my giving and I'm blessed for it beyond measure. I can pillow my head and know that I'm in his care. And I said, he said, I got mad. I said, I'll never go back. A little bit later, he said, hey, listen, will you pray, pray for me, though? He found out I was a preacher. He wanted to get my goat on the whole giving thing. And he said, would you pray for me, though? I said, what is it? He said, well, you know, my wife and I got, had some trouble, and then we got into some other things, and then we started drink, drinking a little bit too much, and then we got into drugs. And he said, we both got into some drugs. Then it went, got worse drugs. And he said, now, he said, we can't get off of it. We're trying to get off of it. He said, it's, man, I'm working overtime trying to pay for drugs. And then he said, honestly, I've started selling some on the side. It's illegal, I know, but I've been selling some just to buy it. He said, it's gotten up to hundreds of dollars a week that we're just using just to satisfy our own cravings. He said, it's just an awful thing. We are in a terrible torrent. He said, well, you pray for me I said I will but I said can I say something to you he said what I said it would have been a lot cheaper if you'd have stayed in church and given your tithe and give what God told you to give Amen. now Satan is just ravaging your life Pentecost was a celebration of the goodness of God in their life and they would convene every year on the day of Pentecost. Every year they had the feast, the feast of Passover, the feast of first fruits, where they would give God the first fruits of their increase. And then Pentecost was the harvest, where they would say, Okay, we've given of our, our, our first fruit of what you've blessed us with. Now we're going, to, we're going to look toward the harvest. And they would plant an offering before God every year on Pentecost. And it was while this celebration was going on, God says, I am going to plant a church in the earth. I am going to give my son. Now I'm going to give my spirit, and I'm going to shove 120 out there, and that's going to multiply to 3,000, and then that's going to multiply to eight to 10,000 in another chapter, the next chapter over, and that's going to keep going and going and going and going. You understand God says, I'm giving my first fruit and I'm giving my Pentecost offering so that lives may be changed. Amen. You saw the testimony of Ben and Megan. You saw that. Now, this is not a self-serving statement. It has nothing to do with Troy Irvin. But God used this church. Now, what if this church wasn't here? What if, we'd, what if we wouldn't have obeyed God and said, we're, we're, not, we're going to have, not have a Sunday night service? And we had that Sunday night service and the glory of the Lord come. And God came on this boy. He come down here. I'll never forget that service. I'll never forget Ben when he came down here. I've known Ben for a lot of years. And I watched God do a work in his heart. And I watched God do a work in their life. In her heart. You hear me? What about the man that was over here in the early service? He'd been coming to our church off and on for years. Never had come to faith. And just a few weeks ago, sitting right over here, he had shown up. He hadn't been here for months. He would shown up, and the Lord touched his heart, and he came over here, and he knelt right here, and he prayed. He came to me. He said, this morning, he said, I got to tell you, preacher, I wish I'd have done it years ago. He said, what I'd done three weeks ago is the best thing that's ever happened in my life. He said, God has changed my life completely. Amen. God has changed my life. Huh? Let's go a step farther. Let's say we didn't have that Sunday night service. Let's say this church wasn't here. And let's say that, that there wasn't a place for God to deal with Ben's heart and God to deal with Megan's heart. Let's say that they split up. What happens to that little girl they were trying to adopt? The one we saw running around here, running around here. I'd like to have her in here right now because you guys are deader than 4 o'clock. I need some help. I'd do anything to have her. 
What happens to that little girl? Look at me. Look at me. What happens to that little girl? God knows where she ends up. Who ends up with her? What do they teach her? How do they raise her? What kind of blessing does she have in her life? It might have gone the whole other route. Instead of being raised to serve and honor God, she could have been raised to live like the devil and go to hell, die on drugs as a teenager. Anything could have happened. But instead, we're at a place where lives are being changed. It is the difference. Look at me. It is the difference between Pentecost at Sinai and Pentecost in Jerusalem. I don't want death. I want life. I'm going to give what God tells me to give so that they can be changed and he can be changed and she can be changed and they can be changed and lives. I'm not, I'm not giving to a building. I'm not giving to a preacher. I'm giving to lives. You hear me? That's what this whole deal is. It says you can have a calf. Listen, you can make a church your calf if you want to. I don't care. If next week they say you can't have this building no more, then I'll land on the street somewhere and I'll tell somebody that Jesus Christ can change their life. Huh? We'll find a bar. They, they're not open on Sunday morning. We'll meet there if we have to. You think I'm crazy? I'll tell you what, we could, we could have a Holy Ghost meeting. They'd have trouble getting drunk that night in that bar. Huh? That's what I'm telling you. We're not, we're not giving to a calf. We're not celebrating and worshiping a building for heaven's sake. This is only something we use so that he and she and that man and a hundred and two hundred and thousand and ten thousand more. Listen, how many people out there this morning need what God is doing in this church? How many out there need it? Thousands and thousands and thousands. And God says, if you will be faithful as I was to give my first fruit, and I was to plant toward the harvest in Pentecost, that's all I'm asking you to do is to do what God tells you to do. And if God tells you over the next seven months to give a dollar, then give a dollar. If God tells you to give a hundred, then give a hundred. If God tells you to give a thousand or ten thousand, I don't care what it is, whatever he tells you to give, then make that your Pentecost offering and say, Lord, I'm going to do what you did. We already saw what man can do at Sinai, build a calf and bring death. But God says... Planted in what I'm doing and bring life. Everybody stand, please. We're going to do two things. One, the ushers are going to take place, their place, and we're going to receive this special offering. Every month in some way over the next seven months, there's going to be a life-changed offering. I am a life changed. There are going to be more testimonies. This doesn't end today. I just want you to hear me. Today we're going to receive the first one, the first big offering. I gave in the first service. They didn't give me my check back to give again. But just so you know, I gave in the first one. I don't want you to think that I didn't. I did. And I'm going to give every month to it. And I want to ask you to do the same and follow suit and do the same. I want you to give something today. Whatever you can, whatever you have, whatever the Holy Ghost says, give something. And we're going to believe God to do some supernatural things. And I'm asking you to give with this in mind. Not to pay for a building. That's secondary. I want you to give to say, God, just as Pentecost was giving toward the harvest. Study it out, children. That's what, it's, that's what it was all about. Just as it was giving like you did toward the harvest, I'm giving toward the harvest. And that's what I want to ask you to do. Give toward souls, lives being changed. And then, maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ. Or maybe you're watching. Or maybe you're here today and you've got some things going on in your life. Or you just say, I need prayer. 
I want you to know that this altar is always open. At any moment, you're in this church and you want to pray and seek God, you come up here while we're singing, while we're receiving offerings, while we're preaching. I don't care. It's always open. But what I am going to do is I'm going to stand here while this offering is taking place and I'm going to ask you, if you need prayer, you come and see me and I'm going to pray with you for whatever you need today. I'll wait on you. I'll wait on you to come. So I'm going to have them receive the offering. And uh, you come, please. You come if you need prayer. Father, I pray that you'll bless this offering. I ask that you would multiply it for your glory. Multiply it back into our lives. Multiply it in this church. Lord, we want Acts chapter 2 Pentecost, not Sinai Pentecost. We want to plant for the harvest just as you did. And we do so today in honor and in reflection of who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, fellows. Sing it.
know, do you love Jesus? That's exciting. We're in a good place to be today. What a, what a glorious day. I love seeing what God is doing in our church. Listen, we, we haven't even begun to see. We're just scratching the surface. You know, we were, when they were playing that video, and we were, I was watching that aerial shot of the church and this location and all the different, you know, uh, cars and the different roads and sitting right here, right off of 275. Listen, God has put us here for a big purpose. Amen. You hear me? A big purpose. And there are thousands of people that are going to come to the knowledge of His saving grace. At the end of the day, when we all stand before God, the only thing that really matters is what we did in service to the Lord. Everything else is going to burn up. Everything else is going to fade away. But what we do with Him will last forever. Amen. Amen. Well, look at your neighbor and say, I love you. Amen. God bless you. Let me get out here. There's still a few of you left. I'll shake your hand on the way out the door. Sing us out the door.